Hello, my name is Andres Karius. Uh, I am a um, research fellow at um, the Cultural Data Analytics Research Group at Tallinn University and a member of the Humanities Department. But here today, I am in front of you as uh, a private sector person because I am also active in, in the um, professional development sector in the company Data Figure Limited. And I've been tasked uh, today to give you a quick overview of various generative AI tools. Uh, including ChatGPT, but also image generated like state of diffusion. We're going to have a quick look at what these machines can do. Uh, I'm sure some of you have played around with them a little bit already. Uh, and then we're going to discuss some um, burning questions that probably affect all of us, like right now. Yeah, so, so as this uh, little intro slide uh, kind of shows, uh, this is a bit of a hot topic. So these sort of models, the generative models, both in the domain of text and image, uh, have been around for a while. But the difference is that now they're something like really, really good. So the text models are now capable of generating very realistic text. Uh, they have been shown to pass various uh, tests that, well, at the sort of level of the average student or better. Well, some people are nervous because their jobs are being replaced possibly very soon. Uh, some people see them as very good and useful assistants, and some people uh, see it as just a big hype bubble and something that should be resisted and, and banned. But um, regardless of where you stand on these questions, uh, the, the inevitable fact is that these things are here and people are using them and your students are definitely using them. So we should figure out what's, what we can do about it. Uh, yeah, so if you have any questions, just ask right away. Like, I don't, I don't need to monologue all, all the time. Like, if there are questions, if something is unclear, uh, just ask right away. The same goes for Zoom. If you're on Zoom, then just turn on your microphone and make a noise. And, and yeah. Right in the chat. Okay, so um, let's get started. Yeah, and we're going to run for like an hour and a half today. First, it's going to be a bit of a lecture, uh, basic terms, so everybody's on the same page. And then some practical examples of things that you can do with these tools. Uh, if we have time, we're going to run some live demo, depending on how much experience you have already with these tools. Um, and then we're going to discuss, like after seeing the things that you can do, the challenges and opportunities in the near future, and near future being like tomorrow. Um, and then we can, if we have time, but I think hope we will, uh, we're going to do a bit of a, a discussion session. Uh, so it's not that many of you here, as in the last uh, workshops of the university. So there was more on the order of like 50 people, 50 or 70 people. But I think we still have enough people to make some groups. And I'll, I have some uh, things that people have told me that they're worried about, some, some questions. So we're going to try to brainstorm. We're going to write down all the ideas so they won't just disappear into the ether. And then we're going to discuss and see if we have any consensus so sorry if you this just these, these things very differently which is also okay right uh, so uh, first question how many of you have tried chat gpt like just at least turned it on okay most people hand down and now raise your hand again if you're if it's a tool that you're using like you know it maybe not every day but like every week at least a few times in your work or teaching or research or Yep, okay, about the search for hop. Good. I, I, I use that for things. And now for image models, just so I have an idea, how many of you have either used like DALI, uh, Stable Diffusion, Mid Journey, or, or any of these things? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, about the search as well. Great. Right. So I think that means that, um, yeah, I will definitely do the practical samples for all these things. So everybody uh, okay, gets on the same page, and then maybe we'll just, um, yeah, try them out here as well. Right, so basic terms, yeah. So what we're talking about in terms of text here is our la large language models. That is actually the term now. The machine learning models train the vast amounts of textual data to predict the next word. And given the, they're now more powerful, also the next sentence, the next text, and, and so on. If that sounds like autocomplete, that is exactly what it is. GPT is a generative pre-trained transformer. It's a type of late, large language model. OpenAI is a company behind these GPT models including ChatGPT, but also DALI and, and some other things. And then uh, a prompt, which um, 
uh, will come up a few times. Uh, so prompt is an uh, input to a generative model, put simply. Uh, typically, it's a sentence or a little paragraph of text. So something goes in and something goes, go, comes out. Yeah, in terms of image models, so there's can be called image generation or text to image. Uh, these are models that you put in a sentence and get, get an image. Uh, so yeah, stable diffusion, Delhi, and others. And these have got like really good now. So you can do art. This is uh, some a picture that won an art prize, and then people get mad because the artist said, "Oh yeah, I just broke did it using uh, just one sentence." So this room doesn't exist. It's created just by typing two sentences into a prompt. This person doesn't exist. My adopted house. This is the sort of quality we're talking about. But back to language. Um, so ChatGPT is a, what we call a chat bot. Um, it runs on various GPT models. It used to be uh, 3.5, now it's in the fourth generation of the GPTs. It, it kind of answers any question, but it doesn't really know anything. It kind of does, it's kind of weird. Uh, and it definitely sounds like it doesn't know something because it's been explicitly trained to sound authoritative. But what, is it, what it does is it, it predicts answers to, like likely answers to possible questions. But they're also sensible uh, because this has been trained on a massive amount of data, but they can be what they call hallucinations that we call a technical term now. Uh, so it can, if it doesn't have a likely output, it just makes up something. So it's not a silver bullet, but it is pretty good. Um, it's definitely not Wikipedia. There's one thing that people need to understand that it's not a knowledge base. Although some of these models have been mar marketed as such, especially one model by Facebook earlier. Uh, it's not Wikipedia, uh, and it's it's not like a search engine right now, but it's going to be. So these things are like now um, advancing extremely quickly. Uh, Google is obviously coming out with their product. There is the Microsoft Bing. So Bing is the search engine that nobody... <laughs> used so far, but now it's going to be used because it's basically ChatGPT, but with internet access. So any problems that ChatGPT had a problem with like hallucinating things, that's much better. It is currently in closed beta, but I have, I, I've been trying it out. So I have some examples from that as well. There are also like other startups doing these. So there's uh, the u.com, there is also Claude by Anthropic. There's, there's like these, these keep coming like mushrooms after rain. And there's a rapid development towards the integration of chatbots and search engines that, that's that's happening like right now. This technology is uh, not completely new though. Autocomplete has been around since ages. And if you write your Gmail or your town university Gmail, you know, it keeps giving you like the next word. Um, in the GPT models, they've been around for a few years actually. Uh, there's been a service called Write with, with Transformers, um, which is you start writing, it starts writing for you. And the Scrum only that I know many people use. Which is kind of all similar things that kind of do something with your input text. Uh, chatbots are not new, right? they've been used for decades, but they've just been kind of shitty. Uh, plagiarism is not new, so that's a question that comes up with these AI things in the academic contexts. But there's always been an option. Like if you really don't want to write this easy, you just buy, you know, you just pay somebody some money and you get it. And the difference is now is that you know you had, in the past you had to find somebody, pay them money get something back, but now it's just you click a button and you have something. And of course, ChatGPT is indeed not the only generative model of its kind, but there's like a whole whole bunch of these things now, but some of them are uh, more geared towards, for example, copywriting or, or specific applications. And indeed there is all these other models like text image, text video, text audio, uh, and you name it. So what we have is a bit of a generative AI model spoon going on. Uh, but I don't think it's a bubble. It does bring challenges as well as opportunities. I personally think it's an opportunity. This sort of destruction is an opportunity to rethink some fossilized concepts. Um, I think it's an opportunity to rethink some things like why are we doing and teaching certain things. The education sector and the job market are about to undergo a massive shift. There, there's no way of run to run from that there is no point in hiding your head in the sand but i think there's also an opportunity for town university to to show the way i mean after all this is a university with a, a history of, of education sciences um i think we should uh, really 
uh, use this as an opportunity. Uh, indeed, uh, last week there was the sort of round table of Estonian universities where I was also invited to participate. And uh, I, I think it's great that Tallinn University is leading this initiative um, and then seems to be, they seem to continue to do so. Currently, uh, I'm sorry to put it, everybody agrees that this thing is not going away and can't be banned, but I don't quite see enough um, drive to start changing things. And I think we do need to change some things. Right, so that, that's a quick, quick sort of theoretical overview of what these things are. Any questions about that so far? Yeah, good. So I, I'd like to devote some time just on practical examples. So that's going to be from ChatGPT and Bing and also image generation examples. So those of you who have tried it, and most of you have, you know, you, that's how it works. You put in a sentence and it gives you something. And if you give it something vague, then it gives you a vague answer. If you give it something specific, then you get something better. You can write speeches and essays. Um, it might come up like kind of hallucinate facts, but you can check the facts. Um, it is quite good in English. It's also pretty decent in Estonian. And the latest version with the GPT-4 is even better in Estonian. Uh, it doesn't make like quite logical sort of inference. It can kind of figure things out. Just the same prompt in Bing. Uh, so it also gives you like something of an essay, but it also these little numbers there. So these are clickable links. So if you haven't, has anybody tried Bing? But, uh, yeah, no? yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I think two. Yeah. I highly recommend signing up for the closed beta. You just have to like sign up and join a line and you can. Uh, Network time yeah, because it, it is quite useful. I've been using it for religious research, for example. Like you can kind of reason it with, ask for it for, um, for suggestions, and then if it gives you wrong ones, then you can oh, so tell it, like, okay, but give me something slightly different. So it's, it's a kind of a different way of searching. It still has the hallucination problem that CPT does, but you can actually click on the link and see if whatever it, it told you is it's actually based on a reasonable source. Okay, so it's now connected to the internet, but also and, and knows about a lot of people, so including like Gustav Suisse and Robert Ferns. So I was wondering, what does it know about me? Um, so it's a bit narcissistic, but you know. So I asked, like, who am I? Uh, they told me that I am an Estonian researcher, researcher and a data scientist. I won't call myself a data scientist, but it's not exactly off the mark. Uh, with expertise in computational linguistics, state analysis, and complex systems. Yeah, that's kind of what I do. Uh, it says that I have background in linguistics and physics, which physics, I'm not a physicist, but I have collaborated and find a paper with physicists so that I can see what, how it came to that inference. So basically, yes, I'm in the training data. Probably so you. Uh, this one, so ChatGPT says that I have been associated with the University of Edinburgh, which is true, I did my PhD there. Uh, Bing searches for uh, matches. Um, but it finds these old web pages. So on some University of Edinburgh websites, it still says that I'm a PhD researcher. So it, I would, this is reasonable. This is the inference that a human could also make to find these old websites that have not much related. But you can click on the links and see if that's true. Uh, it couldn't find my homepage, but it did find my Twitter. Um, so, so what else can it do? It, it, you can think of it as a bit of a, a practical assistant. Uh, so let's say you're writing some text that you, maybe you don't want to write, have the AI generate the whole text from scratch, but maybe you just want to give it an idea to get, get you started. So I imagine like, for example, in media, uh, people do write lots of texts, which are, they kind of write all over, over and over again. Or if you, let's say I just, came up with a random example, let's say I'm a journalist tasked to write about the new wind farm, you know, I could start writing, you know, open word and start writing the text, or I could have ChatGPT just write me a generic newspaper article about wind farms and just plug in the new, where the new one is and it will be done much quicker. The other example here is just uh, how to turn data into text. So here's some imaginary uh, AI powered coffee cup. Uh, give me a product description, and uh, yeah, it does that. It's pretty, pretty nice copy. It can do math pretty well. I mean, it's not that it messes up, but yeah, it does math. I also tried this doing in sort of 
high school uh, text math test so it's, it's, I mean, it sometimes messes up because it actually doesn't have a model of mathematics in it but it has seen so many numbers and it's trained data that kind of has a concept of numbers and it can fairly well explain also why it gets to um, the results that it does yeah, so here's just like a sort of IQ test. Not that I'm a big believer in IQ tests. It does require some reasoning. Um, and you can do those pretty well. It's just with the uh, questions and it gives you answers. These ones happen to be correct. So that's, you can see that there's a little logo here, the, the little green thing that's ChatGPT 3.5. So that's the model that is currently available to, to free users. Um, if, it's, if the logo is black, then it's the you know, four, the fourth generation ChatGPT, which is still only available to pay customers. Um, it costs like $22 per month to be a subscriber. But yeah, the fourth version, it, it, they run various um, uh, standardized exams on it. Um, and it, it pretty much passes all. There are like various standardized United States exams you need to do to become a lawyer, to get into university, get the score that gets you university. So yeah, the sort of thing that students do, it does those pretty well. It's also, so the difference also is that chat, the GPT fourth model is uh, multimodal. It's not available as a multimodal model yet. Uh, it's only available still through this text interface and the API is also text-based, but in principle, it is a multimodal model. So that means it can see and understand images also. Yeah, and of course, you know, this is relevant in the case of, for example, like medical knowledge exams where you need to evaluate images. So yeah, it's, it's better than the average student in many standardized tests. Of course, it's a question, what does a standardized test measure if a machine can do it? But that's a different question. How many of you are, have, have have done or do any sort of programming? I do. Yeah, okay. So I found it also pretty useful as a sort of programmer's aid. Uh, every single programmer that I, I have talked to says it's a very useful tool for programming and they won't do programming without it anymore. Um, so here are some like very basic examples, like something you would get in a basic like intro level Python course. Uh, you know, just give the prompt to sort of write this thing, you do this thing and it gives you a piece of code. Um, here's some how to do websites. So uh, yeah, so uh, we, that's like results with GPT three point five. Uh, I've seen also examples of people just posting on Twitter how they just generate entire websites with GPT four, which is again much better at code. So yeah, if if you're engaged in teaching programming, and I sometimes am, then there's no point of teaching programming without this. But there's a problem here, which I will return to the, towards the end. How many of you use um, uh, something like um, Piptex or, or just any uh, any sort of um, reference managers? Seriously? How, wait, how do you do references? Wait, did you do references by hand? By the journal? Oh, well, don't do that. <laughs> uh, please don't do that. That's a horrible waste of time. But okay, th again, that's a different kind of workshop. Please use reference managers. <laughs> waste of time anyway so if you're if you do use them that then that would be very useful because you can turn any any sort of free text um reference into a bit text which you can plug into any reference manager and if you use latex then this is super useful so uh i found we, we have tried out also at the cultural data analytics lab uh, to to use it as a sort of a zero shot pacifier and it, it seems to perform pretty well so this is a bit more technical uh, so basically, in natural language processing, people do all sorts of like classification tasks, like sentiment analysis for product reviews on Amazon or whatever. You know, that's like a very common uh, task. And usually, you train like a specific, you know, like a purpose-built model for it. It could be based on a pre-trained model, but uh, you put some work into it. So this thing works just out of the box. Uh, you just ask it if you hear some texts, give me some tags. So I ask for neutral, positive, and negative, but it could be anything. And uh, yeah, uh, Mordor is pretty negative. <laughs> um, but that's like easy task, right? Uh, let's let's get to like, a, and of course, yeah, it's multi uh, multilingual. It doesn't matter what the language is. It doesn't know what a language is, uh, but it has been trained on all sorts of languages, so it can do translation. Um, but it also 
works pretty well. I mean, this is a very small experiment, but works pretty well on tasks which have been considered quite hard in natural language processing literature. So sarcasm and irony have always been a problem because machines are pretty bad at recognizing them so far. Uh, this this does pretty well. You just ask, is it sarcastic? And it, it kind of figures it out. And it doesn't just label, you know, a sentence that literally mentions sarcasm as sarcastic. So we have an extremely stupid model that does kind of really intelligent things. Because again, it's just next word prediction, kind of, on a massive scale. Well, so it can be used to uh, summarize and report and do things like that. So it's, you know, put in the paper uh, that you don't have time to read and it gives you a, gives you a summary. Can do sort of multilingual literature research. Uh, as demonstrated by this example. So here I took an article by Katrin Tiedenberg about social media and um, asked it to just you know, give me give me references to support, like some claims or, or what references should I use. Uh, and even the model that is not connected to the internet, it does pretty well. I checked all these references and they all exist. Sometimes it does hallucinate references. Mm -hmm. It makes stuff up. But again, this was a more of a problem in 3.5 in, in GPT-4, this is much better. And in Bing, it's not really a problem because it literally finds the actual papers and links. So those people who are like criticizing like a month ago, I guess, <laughs> so these things move super fast now. Um, people were saying, oh yeah, 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 this is no problem in academia because you can always tell by the references or, you know, this is how you catch students. Uh, no, it, it can be references. Um, I might need to return to that point, but there is a bit of a trend of people trying to uh, like come up with reasons why this is not a big deal, and they cherry pick these little examples like, "Oh, I found it said something stupid," or "Oh, look, like it, this book doesn't exist." For example, you know, there's something that engages people. People are happy to find reasons to say that, "Okay, my job is secure. This is this is not a big deal." Um, yeah. I don't think that's a good approach because this, these are like very early models still. Some of them are still beta versions. They've been improved rapidly. They're getting bigger and better. And yeah, yeah. Uh, this is something I added to this slide today. A uh, colleague pointed out that um, there's this nice app called Otter, which uh, you can basically give access to your like Zoom account, and then it. Uh, goes into a Zoom meeting and starts transcribing a Zoom lecture, whatever you're listening to. So here's today's cultural data analytics, um, yeah, the public lecture. So uh, by the way, come to cultural data analytics uh, Monday uh, seminars. So we have this, yeah, usually usually every Monday at two o'clock we have a seminar with external speakers. Um, so somebody was talking about metaphors today. So this is I just plugged in the, the app went there started recording everything it's just automatically taking screenshots of things that it deemed relevant. Uh, so you have the text and with the text now you can do stuff like you know just plug it into GPT. Uh, the fourth version again takes much larger inputs so you can just plug in the whole lecture pretty much or you can always plug it in a, in a couple of chunks. And now you can ask to summarize so maybe you know I wasn't paying attention so now I get the little summary. Um, I can ask specific questions and it finds the answer in the lecture text. I can also generate exam questions based on the lectures, like just like this. And it, you know, I think they're pretty reasonable questions. And also the wrong answers are, I mean, they're just a bit easy, but you know, you can tell it to make it hard. All these sort of tasks where you ask students to summarize a lecture are pointless now. I'm not pointless, but easy to automate. Don't, don't treat your students like automatons. Another use case is it can uh, sort of adjust your spelling and tone. I mean, most of us are probably not English native speakers here. I'm not. But uh, you can uh, just put in a text and say, fix your grammar. I've been doing that a lot recently. Um, this is going to become much easier because uh, this technology is being integrated into both uh, Microsoft Office and Google Box. Like literally right now, these things are coming out in the next weeks. But also, yeah, you can just put your piece of text and put it into ChatGPT, and it will make it better. 
Um, so here's a so here's some song lyrics that I have to make academic and remove all the bad words. And then it, it does indeed. Um, some of us are known to engage in cannibalistic behavior, very fancy. And then you know you can do all sorts of funny things with it or like sort of creative things. So here I said, okay, so take this nice text without swear words and turn it into a rap song in German. And it does it. I don't know if there are any German speakers here, but I mean, I'm not saying it's a good song, but it's, it's mm -hmm. strong. But we can take this a step further and say, okay, so I, I have these lines of text here. Um, why don't you take every line of text and turn it into a business plan for a tech startup? And uh, yeah, I mean, initially when I did this, it said like, okay, this is silly, I'm not gonna do it. And then I said, okay, just make stuff up if you need to, and then it did it. And yeah, it, it seems like a pretty reasonable business plan, you know, define a target market, distinguish from other companies, um, address the market need, uh, establish a brand as, you know, the leading start tech startup as being the real, something shady, and differentiate from imitators. It can, uh, so it's not lingual, you can kind of talk to it in a language and just say, like, give me the answer in whatever language you want. Uh, so you can use it as a sort of language tutor. Um, I ran into a problem when I wanted to make it swear. Uh, so this now touches the topic of, of this sort of um, filtering that has been done on these models. So they're, uh, they have been guardrailed not to produce bad things. Bad things as defined by this one company. So basically just a small group of tech bros in Silicon Valley. Uh, so bad words are one of the things it won't do. Uh, it also won't tell you how to make a bump or do stuff like that unless you ask it really cleverly. But of course you can get around these things and say, oh yeah, yeah please, you know, just give me, give me something that is in the guidelines of the language generation policy, and yeah, then it does. And the certain ones are kind of weird here, but they, you know, some of them are like, okay, Baga, we have no one. Those of you who speak Estonian. Um, but again, this is state point five. Uh, this is number, this is GPT-4, and here the, uh, the words are much more coherent. You can, yeah, you can give examples, translate, uh, explain, and so on. So, so this was originally meant to be a workshop for BFM, um, before it was advertised more widely. Uh, so I guess people who study at BFM, so, you know, students probably might come run into like tasks like writing something over a screenplay or something, I'm guessing. Uh, here I had it write just um, the prompt, that's just the prompt. Give me two characters, post-Soviet Estonia, do, give me something. You know, if you give, the, give it a better prompt, it gives better, but yeah, basically it gave me a, a bar scene between Alexander and Katrin. Um, and it's kind of like a corny dialogue, but you know, it's, it's, it gave me a pretty, pretty long script and the whole story. Um, again, this is GPT-4. Um, you can ask it to criticize you or itself. So here I said, okay, so now criticize it. Um, and it gives pretty, pretty re decent feedback. Um, it, you know, how to make descriptions better, how to improve the dialogue. You know, it sounds a bit cliche, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, and the pacing was a bit rushed, so yeah, you can, you, you know, the feedback is pretty reasonable. I had a chat today, so I was interviewed by the Aribag radio station about these similar topics. And the other guest was somebody who was more get, working in, so at the uh, professional development world, according to that in Estonian, and they said uh, that you know, he's been um, into trying to integrate this into giving feedback to participants of, of their workshops, and it sometimes does a better job than the human. So again, some existential questions there. Um, okay, but let's take this a step further. So okay, we have a script, uh, we have some idea. Okay, let's say I'm a movie maker, I want some concept art. So why, why don't we create a concept art? Uh, so this is using stable diffusion. It's it's an open source image generation model to be deduced we can use it later also. So I just put in like Eastern European detective noir character or something, something you get with these dudes. Uh, but I can also just take the, the script itself and put it in as a prompt and then I get this guy, the Alexander, you know, so that, that's our guy now. So you can do this sort of um, very fast prototyping mood boards, you know, you name it, uh, using these models, they generate pretty fast. Um, if you don't like them, just regenerate them and get more. You can call something, use something called in painting, 
uh, to if you like an image, but you would like something more to be there. So here, you know, Alexandra is here, but where is Catherine? Oh no, so I just blank out this part of the image, and there you go, there's Catherine. The face is kind of weird, but I don't know. At least, you know, as a concept art, I guess it works. And you can, you know, run endless variations. You can just rerun the prompt, but you can also use something called Reimagine, which is uh, by a company that Stable Diffusion just acquired uh, just a few days ago. And it's like a similar image model. Um, the demo they have right now is it doesn't have many options, so the, the style is still not great. Like you can't mess around with it too much, but basically it, it generates variations of an image. Uh, Mid Journey does the same. You can give it an image and, and it gives you variations. So here is Alex, the original image with the ink painting, and here are like variations on the theme, which is it kind of takes the idea of the image. It has some semantic representation inside and it gives you endless variations. Here's the has the guy from concept art, and I can get more guys with beige jackets like this dude. Quite so those of you, I think there are some BFM people here. Does that seem like a useful thing, by the way? Yeah. And you can do like concept art super fast. I I figured that I'm not a movie maker or anything of a creative person, but I figured, you know, why not? I'll I'll um I'll try doing something more creative. So I asked um ChatGPT to give me a um a description and a and a sort of style description of a cartoon that like a short short animation that would do well on film festivals and that's what it came up with so it's yeah it's just some story of an astronaut it gives me some idea for style which is a blend of 2d traditional animation and niche art which i had to google for and uh, then of course you can again put it into stable diffusion and you get some ideas uh, what i did was i literally took some of these paragraphs and put it in as a prompt and I got these things, which I don't know, look pretty cool. I will watch this animation. Um, just a side note, so these little corners that I had in the beginning and those have on some other slides, these are made using another a slightly older uh, image generation model called DALI 2. Uh, I asked for oil paintings and these things. Another great game changer now is Control Net, which is basically kind of like an addition to Stable Diffusion. So Stable Diffusion images, you know, it's a text image. And this is how all these those models, text images will work, right? They put in a text the image comes out. Um, but Control Net allows to kind of control the diffusion, control the generation process. So you can also give it an image and the text. So here I tried scribbling some sort of uh, well, whatever that is, smoking bright, and it gives me this guy. I tried doing a Monet painting, and it kind of does that. And I asked for a cyberpunk company logo with my name on it, and yeah, that's what you got. This technology is like quite nice. You can scribble something, but you know you can also put in an image, and then it does something with the image. If you put in like the wireframe or have it or like application have a text kind of like a edge filter kind of thing, and then it just and then you say what it what you want it to be, and then it does that. So yeah, from that little stick figure you get these these guys, or from that stick figure you can get Michael Jordan, but also this person. So mm -hmm. and this is also pretty handy because CG models is something you can manipulate in a very software like in a Blender or whatever. You make a CD model and then you have you create various variations on that. Um, so yeah, I don't know if there's any point to, for people to pay for soft photos anymore or pay artists or illustrators or anybody because they just do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it works pretty well. Um, and I know there are already uh, there is at least one media house in Estonia that is already using this uh, Dali and Midjourney to illustrate their uh, newspaper articles. Uh, so yeah, I think this makes sense. Obviously, needless to say, none of these things exist. They're all generated. Um, yeah, of course, it has issues. Uh, it propagates biases, obviously, from the training data. So here's a very easy example. If I say, give me some names to the characters, and the nurses are all going to be women, and the uh, doctors are going to be dudes. I mean, yeah, is it a surprise? Probably has it. 
Oh, and all the ur urban criminals are like Latin American and, and black names. So. Okay, so a couple more examples. I do want to also do the discussion part, but um, what if I need cash and money? So here's a, is, that's a question that a student might ask themselves, you know, how, how could I support myself? And there are various scholarships. So here's a little scenario I came up with. I asked you to write, do me two things, an academic letter written by a student who has come, come from like a poor economic background and studies at BFM, and also uh, his or her supervisor uh, who writes, uh, who works at BFM and writes a letter. And honestly, that's pretty well. I, I would give that person money. They like argue why they should be given a scholarship and everything, and how they will use that for the public good or something. Uh, here's also the uh, accompanying letter. This is something uh, you, those of you who are like more senior academics probably you have written quite a lot. You don't need to do that really anymore. You can just ask. So these things are getting faster, better, more accessible. They integrate into office suits, operating systems. If anybody still thinks that it's possible to prohibit or ban them, then no, it really is not. But there's going to be people who try to sell these sort of solutions to you. Like any company that is doing plagiarism detection is panicking right now because it's pointless to do classic plagiarism now. You can just have it generate and generate stuff for you. But you cannot detect these things because you, you really can't. I mean, you can technically find statistical regularities that correspond to the typical outputs of these models, but there is no basis to accuse a student that you know they made something using it. I don't, don't do that. You lose. Um, yeah, the integration that's coming like literally in the next few weeks, and uh, yeah, it's also going to be in the various Google uh, products like include Gmail. Is it plagiarism or no? I, I don't know. It really knows. I guess not. Maybe kind of, sort of. But it, it cannot be proven. But they have, there are questions that need answers. So, like, how, how do you grade homework where you're pretty sure that you know one has been generated in a few minutes and one has been you know worked on properly, maybe for hours or days? Um, and also, there's just electronic cheating issues, which yeah, you can have a chat GPT in your smartwatch and just get all the answers. Any regulations? No. Uh, some universities uh, was, had this knee-jerk reaction of trying to ban it. Um, Aarhus and, and some New York universities started doing that. They realized it can't can be done. Helsinki University, as Berkeley found out, have already guidelines in place. Uh, Helsinki University encourages the use of AI and has like a whole lot of like regulations in place already. We don't, and we really need them. So we should get moving. Near future, which really means like now, tomorrow, and students use these services, but there is no proper guidance, except if a, if a instructor is specifically has looked into it themselves. There are really no rules, so it's a bit of a wild west situation. Um, students can likely see that the AI things are often faster and better writers than they are, so that raises probably questions. The job market will require these skills, because clearly you can automate and be super, much more effective, efficient and productive when you use these things. Yes, there are ethical issues, but the productivity increases, I, I can guarantee you will drown out the, the, this ethics and bias and misinformation, whatever problems people have. There's increasing AI inequality, which I'll read in, in a second. And uh, yeah, asking for certain things is kind of pointless now. I mean, take home essays, I'm not sure. Asking for lecture summaries, as shown by the example before, mm, or not. Uh, recommendation letters, reading journals, yeah. And unless you make it really interesting, that's the challenge now. The question that comes up every 10 years when a new technology comes is, will machines replace humans? Uh, three weeks ago when I did this workshop uh, in a slightly different format, my answer was probably not. I'm not so sure anymore. Uh, probably some questions, like stock photographers and illustrators, some types of photo models. First level customer service is already being integrated. Like, and there's also very good speech to text and text to speech models now. So uh, very soon you won't know if you're talking to a machine or a human, I would say very likely. And if it's a machine, it probably has been instructed to insist that it's a human, not a machine. Um, yeah, prompt engineering and, and sort of skills of around model choice and tool choice will probably become pretty important. 
Um, so I don't think that machines will replace humans, but humans who know how, know how to use machines, they will definitely replace humans. I see it as a bit of a calculator moment though. I mean, it's just a new technology that we, do, we need to work with and work around. So then if you agree with me, then uh, well, should we start teaching these things? Should we start incorporating but then this question of how and what level and what disciplines? Uh, there are questions of a lot, of, a lot of skills are measured actually in writing tasks, but the question of are writing tasks really good anymore as a measure of skill and knowledge? And is it okay for you to use these things? Can you grade student essays and whatever using these tools? Most of you agree. I know because I asked. Uh, so the last three workshops I did, I had a survey, uh, which I will also encourage you again to, you to uh, fill in if you haven't yet. Uh, and most people actually, when asked anonymously, agree. So yeah, should we put content engineering into curriculum? Especially a question for BFM, because you can do all sorts of cool stuff now, including video, music, demos. I have now some examples here. We'll try to run them because well, we have, have a bit of time left, so I'll quickly show you just some things. Here's a, well, here's the same slide, um, but like. Another question right. is this. Should prompt engineering be integrated into the curriculum? Besides text, it is now possible to generate images, video, 3D models, music, and more. Oh, and by the way, I don't exist. Oh, me neither. Although I look pretty real, I am just an AI avatar that Andres created in a hurry because he couldn't be bothered to narrate his own bloody slides. But I'm guessing it's probably also because he ain't even half as handsome as I am. Winky face, winky face. So these sort of online lectures, um, yeah, I, I can see some of you thinking, oh yeah, maybe I don't have to narrate this thing anymore. What else? Uh... I'll show you just like a clip of that. I stand before you, not as an expert, but as a concerned citizen. One of the 400,000 people who marched in the streets of New York on Sunday. And the billions of others around the world who want to solve our climate crisis. As an actor, I pretend for a living. I play fictitious characters. So this is in the Zoom, I think here it's a bit out of sync. Basically, it's, it's perfectly lip sync. So. Next one. Yeah, okay, so here's something that might be relevant for BFM. Now we're stuck on this stupid tower in the middle of nowhere. And I don't blame you, and now we're stuck on this stupid... Stuck on this stupid freaking tower in the middle of freaking nowhere. And it's all my fault. Yes, it's all for my fault. So again, things are going to get interesting. Um, yeah, so text to video is still kind of not working that well. Text to 3D is uh, kind of working now. Um, so yeah, these things are moving also pretty fast. Um, okay, I'm going to apologize in advance. This is going to be extremely corny, but I didn't make these lyrics. I just asked ChatGPT to write lyrics about an AI operating and then plug these lyrics into a service that creates little... Uh, songs so anyway not like super great but you can sort of see what this is doing Um, but now getting to some problems, um, those, those people who have doubled in these, um, AI apps in the last couple of months, I mean, they're going to be more productive and faster and they'll have more to time to do other things, including students. And those who won't adapt will be in a weaker position. There's no way around that. And this, it's financial, there's always the financial dimension. So those with a, with a bit of extra money can pay for pro versions. That applies to ChatGPT and other things as well. You can play more with them without limits and you will learn more and learn faster. If we require AI usage in a course, if we go that direction, then that will increase inequality in that sense. 
Uh, the Helsinki University example, they say that AI cannot be required if the app is not free, but they're all free, but also not because the free version is always a bit limited. But if you use it, then you probably want the subscription to use the better version and the faster version. So you know, should you pay it? Should your employer pay it? These are sort of questions that need answers. Things are going to get weird. Um, so the, these things are now integrated into, for example, Slack, uh, Gmail. So now we can have scenarios like a human makes uh, AI write a long email from a little prompt. The recipient uses their AI to summarize that lengthy blah, blah, blah email into one sentence. Or equivalently, student makes AI produce some code or essay or creative work, and the professor makes AI grade it. Well, let's take one step further. A writer produces an essay using AI. Student makes AI compose a reading journal. Professor makes AI write lengthy feedback to this reading journal. Student uses AI to summarize feedback into a sentence. These are things I, I bet these things already happen. This is where we are. Um, yeah, so, okay, so I'm going to finish, finish talking now in a few, like a minute. Some things I, I want to kind of leave with you before we start with the discussions, which we will have a nice half an hour, so that's great. ChatGPT output is stochastically generated, it's not encyclopedic, it's not a knowledge base, remember that. There's some confusion between models, so ChatGPT is not connected to the internet, it's been trained on a fixed corpus and that's it. But then the Bing version is connected and the Google version will be. So some people actually thought that ChatGPT already searches internet. The way you see it, these tools can be useful assistants, but they should not be blindly used to prepare factual methods, you know, check what it does. Uh, I just incidentally, when this came out like in January, I, I saw also a um, uh, sort of a little workshop for uh, regular school teachers and then they were very happy to like, oh yeah, we can now do materials with them. This is, you know, not a good idea. It's a good idea to use it as an assistant. Um, and final idea, uh, well, semi-final, but don't, don't fall into the trap of dismissing these things as not good enough, because just because it makes some mistakes. I mean, these are early versions. They're getting much better, very, very fast. People who bring out these examples are like, oh, look, it did something wrong. I mean, they, they probably, there's a good chance they don't know how to do prompt engineering. So don't lull yourself into false security. This, this thing is not going well. So um, since there's nothing from above yet, no um, instruction from, from people who should be providing guidelines, then, then we, we are left with, um, just us to figure things out ourselves. So this is what I propose to do the rest of yeah, 20, 27 minutes. Um, we'll do little groups. Um, 